Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about a discovery of what seems to be the record holder when it comes to very unusual objects known as contact binaries. In this case discovered in the galaxy very close to us, one of our partners known as Small Magellanic Cloud, a galaxy that's actually unique and unusual for a different reason we're going to be discussing in this video. And so this new discovery that, as always, you can find in the description below, described in more detail in this paper, in essence, finds the most massive contact binary stars ever seen, and something that we actually only expect to discover in the extremely ancient universe, mostly because it's almost impossible for any of these stars to be kind of formed today. And so let's actually discuss what the scientists have discovered here, and why it's somewhat important. But first, let's start with the idea of what exactly these binaries are. Here's actually one of the more famous ones, located about 1800 light years away from us. And so essentially here, what you're looking at is a kind of a hybrid star. It's not necessarily a binary star, but it's also obviously not a single star either. In essence, it's a bit of both. It's two stars that started touching one another, and though they still orbit around one another, in some sense they also represent a single object. Mostly because they also exchange the material in their envelopes, in the process acquiring extremely similar properties, basically resembling one another. And although quite a lot of these objects are believed to exist out there, in most cases the ones we usually detect are also known as eclipsing binaries, because in essence these two stars, as they orbit around one another, tend to produce brightening and darkening peaks, but usually extremely fast. In a typical contact binary system, this might actually only take anywhere from a few hours to possibly a day or two. And so when the scientists discover an eclipsing binary that only takes a few hours, it's almost always a contact binary. They're also sometimes referred to as W Ursa Majoris variables, named after the star W Ursa Majoris. The star with a very specific light curve, where everything here changes every 8 hours, implying an 8 hour orbit. But the main feature that makes these stars so unusual is of course the mixing of material, and in the process of this mixing, they both acquire similar properties and kind of resemble one another. In this case, even the smaller star will usually have hotter temperature, thus allowing it to evolve very differently. But this unusual configuration can actually stay stable for millions or even billions of years. So these objects can survive for a pretty long time. And today the scientists understand these objects well enough to even potentially predict their emissions or maybe even explosions on their surface. One of the most intriguing observations in the last decade or so, the explosion of V838 Monocerotis might have actually started as a kind of a contact binary where two stars joined together, releasing all of this in the process. And something similar was even predicted to happen back in 2022, with the star even potentially becoming extremely bright in the process, but in this case the scientists actually miscalculated based on their own observations in regards to the period of the stars with newer observations using Gaia telescope determining the distances and the actual periods much more accurately. But when it comes to some of the most giant and most impressive contact binaries, for a pretty long time the record holder was located in the Large Magellanic Cloud, VFTS 352. It's part of the iconic Tarantula Nebula that contains some of the most massive stars known to us. And like so many other stars in the Tarantula Nebula, these are two very hot stars, approximately 40,000 degrees Celsius, and they take approximately one day to orbit around one another. Based on various observations coming from the system, in the past the scientists have even determined that these stars are possibly responsible for the production of a lot of, if not most of the oxygen in the entire galaxy. So in some sense, this is maybe where oxygen on planet Earth came from as well. Not these specific stars, but some of the similar stars nearby. But eventually, because of the mass of these stars, they're probably going to become binary black holes. As a matter of fact, quite a lot of the binary black holes that we're detecting today might have started with something extremely similar. In other words, the majority of gravitational waves detected from black hole collisions might have had their start as contact binaries billions of years ago. But all of this would require really, really massive stars, a lot more massive than anything in the Milky Way galaxy, and definitely much more massive than any contact binary near us as well. As a matter of fact, as of 2023, so far no star has been observed in the vicinity of planet Earth that in theory could become binary black holes and collide sometime in the future. Which is of course really weird because we're detecting these all the time from a lot of other galaxies. And there is actually an explanation, a physical explanation, for why we don't seem to have them in the Milky Way. For why these stars are kind of rare in the Milky Way. Our galaxy is quite developed and overall is relatively high in metallicity. Or in other words, it contains a lot of elements that are not hydrogen, not helium, and quite a lot of heavier elements, 
such as oxygen, carbon and so on. And based on observations, scientists know today that stars that have very heavy elements will usually produce much stronger winds, solar winds, compared to a similar star that's low in metallicity containing mostly hydrogen and helium. In other words, metallicity increases star activity, increases solar winds, and basically causes really heavy stars to sort of blow themselves apart. We sort of observe these effects from really massive stars known as wolf rayet stars, like the one you see right here taken by the James Webb Space Telescope. And so this kind of creates a bit of a paradox. We want to discover these really massive stars, responsible for various black holes we're detecting, responsible for various black holes we're detecting from other galaxies, but it looks like the stars that are produced in the Milky Way on average are a little bit too active to be able to create necessary binary systems in order to then create black hole binaries that can collide. But since the early universe was much lower in metallicity, it's quite common to see black hole collisions from stars that might have existed billions of years ago, with the exception being the star I mentioned previously in the Large Magellanic Cloud. But in order to study the early universe, we don't actually have to look very far. It just so happens that one of the galaxies very close to the Milky Way, to some extent, is kind of primitive. It hasn't experienced a lot of collisions, it hasn't experienced a lot of elemental evolution, and it's extremely low in metallicity compared to anything else. The galaxy of Small Magellanic Cloud, approximately 210,000 light years away from us, just so happens to be about one seventh in terms of metallicity compared to the Milky Way, extremely similar to very distant galaxies that existed 8 to 10 billion years ago, which suggests that we're looking into the past. It's basically like looking at stars and various objects that existed 10 billion years ago. And that also implies that, in theory, we should be able to find stars with very unusual properties that no longer exist, in order to basically prove some of these propositions and some of these ideas, which, as you can imagine, just happened right now. The science has discovered is the most massive compact binary ever seen, something that would be probably impossible in the Milky Way galaxy, but something that is quite possible, and possibly even quite common, in this low in metallicity galaxy in the small Magellanic Cloud. The smaller star here is about 32 solar masses, and it's losing its mass to its bigger companion that's about 55 solar masses. And based on the calculations for the amount of mass lost right now, or the amount of mass that the larger star is consuming, it's quite likely that the smaller star is going to become a black hole in possibly about 700,000 years. At this point, very likely becoming what's known as an X-ray binary, where the black hole then starts to consume mass from the larger object, and for about 3 million years is going to produce quite a lot of different emissions, including X-rays and potentially gamma rays, and then it's going to eat enough to make the larger star into a black hole as well. These objects might even collapse into black holes directly without going through supernova stage. But more importantly, it's going to produce a binary black hole system very close to one another and with masses very similar to what the scientists have been observing coming from various black hole collisions out there. Although in this case, this binary is going to remain this way for potentially 18 billion years. In other words, the black holes are not going to be colliding anytime soon. Eventually, though, they will collide, producing gravitational waves for just a fraction of a second. And so in this case, this particular observation is more of a proof of ideas we've had for a very long time. For example, the fact that larger stars or more massive stars are more likely to exist in low in metallicity galaxies, and are probably quite common in the small Magellanic Cloud, and a pretty good explanation for binary black hole collisions that the scientists have been detecting since 2015. Pretty much all of these came from relatively far away, usually billions of light years away from us, when the universe had a lot of these stars everywhere, with quite a few of them evolving into black hole systems and eventually colliding, something that seems to be a relatively rare phenomenon in the modern universe. Although I guess in this case, we now have at least one candidate in the Large Magellanic Cloud and an even more interesting candidate in the smaller, less developed Small Magellanic Cloud. With the total mass of this binary being about 87 solar masses, and the temperatures of the stars being 43,000 Celsius and 38,000 Celsius. So pretty much as extreme as it gets. But at least for now, that's pretty much all we have. A pretty important confirmation for the modern theories, and I guess a new record holder for a very unusual type of a star, but until future studies and future discoveries, that's pretty much it. Thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who has learned about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.